Uh, I want to thank you all for uh, showing up here tonight and thank the panelists. Uh, this is a, an issue that is near and dear to my heart that I've been struggling with ooh, for the past 16 years and every year it gets a little worse. How worse? We're going to start with Matt. He's going to give a presentation on the state of media, uh, both locally and nationally. Matt? Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you to uh, Civic Ventures and Town Hall for having me, all of you for coming out tonight. Uh, I am Matt Gertz. I am Senior Fellow at Media Matters for America, uh, which uh, since 2004 has been a progressive media watchdog organization that monitors the mainstream and right-wing press for conservative misinformation, uh, analyzes it, and reports it out on our uh, website, mediamatters.org. Uh, so we are generally media critics. We are people who point out when we think journalists aren't doing their job, trying to get them to do it better. Uh, but I'm here tonight because we at Media Matters also realize that uh, while journalists sometimes fail their mission, their mission is critically important to our democracy, and, and it is very much in danger. So I'm going to uh, walk you through some developments uh, in uh, the journalism industry. Uh, I'll be talking a lot about uh, reporters getting laid off and papers closed. And please try to remember that every laid off reporter, uh, the, the cost is in stories that aren't told about public corruption and corporate greed uh, and inequality, uh, and that the cost of every shuttered newspaper is a less informed public. Uh, but let's start here. If I can. Aha! All right. Where Americans get their news. Uh, so, as you can see, uh, television is still the top source uh, for uh, people getting their news, though it is declining. Uh, online news websites and social media have eclipsed print newspapers, uh, and that movement is particularly rapid in younger generations. Uh, you see um, that they almost never take uh, print newspapers, uh, rarely uh, consume news through television, much more social media and online uh, models. So this has uh, major implications for the business news model, uh, as does uh, the divide that we have in trust in the media. There's been a very successful effort by conservatives to convince their supporters that the media can't be trusted. Uh, Donald Trump's attacks on fake news as the enemy of the people are clearly playing a big role, as you can see in that huge gap that opens up at the end, but that is, uh, you know, continuing a pattern that really took off in the late 1990s, uh, which is when Fox News was founded uh, and built an explosion of growth in the right-wing media based on uh, convincing everyone that the regular media couldn't be trusted. So Media Matters was founded in part uh, to monitor and report on this large and growing ecosystem of right-wing media outlets. Uh, we like to say we watch them so you don't have to, so you're welcome. Thank, yeah, there it is. Uh, so, but F Fox News is the major component, but it's really uh, much broader than that. You have talk radio hosts like Glenn Beck across the country, a whole slew of conservative uh, commentators and columnists like Michelle Malkin, online outlets like Breitbart and The Daily Caller. Uh, they've built this massive parallel media infrastructure uh, that ensures that conservatives never need to come in contact with facts that they don't already agree with. Uh, and they can do that because they have this big audience of conservatives who are convinced that uh, only right-wing media is giving them the truth, and because there are some right-wing billionaires who are willing to spend a lot of money uh, to uh, increase their political influence. Conservatives have also been quite effective on uh, social media, on Facebook, uh, on YouTube, on Twitter, uh, and we should probably talk a bit about Sinclair Broadcast Group, which is a major player in this ecosystem, uh, including right here in Seattle, uh, where they own uh, Como. Um, they reach nearly 40% of Americans with local news coverage, and the way they operate is they have uh, centralized uh, news gathering apparatus that creates these conservative propaganda segments that they then send out to local stations across the country. Uh, you know, it's in some ways more effective than Fox News because you don't expect to get that sort of thing from your local news. You, generally, people have more trust for those outlets. Um, so, you may not pay attention to this right wing media ecosystem, but it is a uh, nonetheless having a major impact on the public debate and on policy happening all around you. 
I'll give you an example. So uh, I think you all probably know about Seattle is Dying, the uh, Como special on uh, homelessness uh, that uh, came out back in March uh, and it was uh, quite uh, unfavorable to uh, homeless people uh, here in the city. Uh, the special did not stay in the city, though. It racked up five million views on YouTube, and then it moved through this right-wing ecosystem. Within five days, it was on Fox News, on Tucker Carlson's show, here one of your local conservative radio hosts talking about it, again the next day on Fox and Friends. Uh, it got wrapped into a broader conservative uh, sort of narrative that they were spinning out about how democratic cities are ungoverned and ungovernable, uh, sometimes talking about Seattle, but often picking it up through various cities in California. And the way this works is they just sort of keep going. They do segment after segment after segment about it, all the different outlets are working in parallel. Uh, traditionally, Fox News has been powerful because of its large audience, uh, but more recently, it's powerful because the President of the United States is a member of that audience. Uh, he spends hours each day watching Fox News and often tweeting aggressively about what he sees there, and it builds into his worldview and affects the policy coming out of this administration. And so uh, we had this report come out in September that uh, Trump was planning a major crackdown on homeless camps in California. What seems to have happened here is he watched a lot of uh, conservative media and now he is reacting to it. This is just one example. Uh, this cycle from conservative media fixation to presidential action is really happening all the time. By contrast to this growing right-wing media ecosystem, uh, traditional media outlets are not doing well across the country, including here in Seattle. Uh, ten years ago, the city had two uh, daily newspapers and two weeklies, but the Post-Intelligencer um, you know, went online only in 2009. It slashed its newsroom repeatedly. Now it only has a handful of journalists working there. Uh, the uh, Seattle Times still publishes in print, but has had layoff after layoff after layoff. Um, the Stranger has gone bi-weekly. The Seattle Weekly is online only. Um, you know, from there in television, all of your local, uh, broad, uh, your local TV stations are owned by huge national conglomerates. Como was the last independent, bought by Sinclair in 2013, subsequently cut its uh, many investigative team jobs. Uh, you used to have uh, a, a NBC News, a Seattle-based breaking news outlet. That closed. Uh, Northwest Cable News shuttered in 2017. These are all trends that have been playing out across the country. What's happening in Seattle is happening everywhere else. Uh, local digital startups are uh, forming to try to fill some of the gaps in coverage. Uh, but it's a really big gap to fill. Um, since the beginning of the Great Recession, total newsroom employment has fallen every year. It has tumbled by a huge amount in the first years uh, of that recession, but uh, you know, continuing to tick down. A handful of major dailies are doing well, but in general, the business model for local and regional newspapers is failing. Uh, nearly 1,800 newspapers have closed between, uh, since 2004, uh, which means nearly half of the nation's counties have no newspaper. Uh, and 200 counties have none at all. Broadcast jobs holding steady, digital jobs trending up, um, but there's just that huge decrease uh, in working uh, journalists in print journalism. So what, what is going on here? Why is this model failing? Uh, well, there's two major ways that newspapers make money. They make it from their subscribers, uh, and they make it by charging advertisers uh, to get access to those subscribers. So I pointed out earlier that fewer people get their news from print papers than in the past. This is what that looks like. Just a dramatic decline in overall circulation. It starts kicking off uh, in the early 2000s, uh, around the time that the internet is really spinning up. But that's not really a coincidence. Uh, and then, you know, the Great Recession hits and it just sort of falls off a cliff. Um, so that also impacts the advertising revenue because uh, advertisers are not going to pay the same amount of money to reach fewer people, but also because the move to online models has really cut down on the overall amount of money getting spent uh, in print advertising in general. So there's another huge gap, just 
you know, tens of billions of dollars that used to go into newspapers and now does not. And as you can see, there's a slight tick up in the uh, online uh, advertising, but not anywhere near enough to make up the gap. Why is that? Well, all of this advertising money online is going towards big tech companies, Facebook, Google, and the like, uh, which are taking up more than half of the overall revenue. So together, these factors create what we call the newspaper death spiral. First, you have revenues start to fall. Uh, and then, because revenues are decreasing, papers will do a lot of other things, but eventually, they're going to start cutting staff. You have newsroom layoffs. Uh, with a smaller newsroom, the paper needs to cut back its coverage. Maybe it gets rid of its state house reporter. Maybe it gets rid of coverage of some ring suburbs if it's a city newspaper. Uh, all in all, what it means is that the quality of the newspaper declines. Uh, and when the quality declines, circulation falls. If you were taking the paper in part because of the coverage of those suburbs or that state capital, and suddenly the coverage isn't there, you're probably not going to keep paying for the paper. And so revenue decreases again. And now we're off to the races. We're just going around and around this little circle, uh, and that just sort of continues until eventually uh, the newspaper fails. This is... Uh, Pretty frightening stuff, and uh, things are likely to get worse, frankly. Um, 7,200 jobs lost in the media this year through the first nine months. That represents the worst decline in uh, newsroom jobs since the Great Recession. Uh, a lot of those jobs are being lost in the big digital newsrooms that people thought were going to be the wave of the future. Places like HuffPost, places like Vice, places like BuzzFeed have been dropping large portions of their newsroom in response to uh, weaker revenues than expected. And it's probably going to get worse than this, uh, because all the losses that we've seen this year are against an economy that is largely pretty strong. Not doing well for everyone by any stretch of the imagination, but it's not in recession, and a recession always comes. And if you'll remember from this chart, you, you've got that big drop, that 15,000 in the first three years against the Great Recession. The next recession is going to cause a pretty substantial loss of revenues and jobs in journalism. Uh, unfortunately, that's where I'm going to leave it. Um, the decline in local media is a huge problem, uh, but I'm looking forward to, to talking about uh, solutions that people are finding here locally and, and what might uh, produce better results in the future. Thank you. <laughs> <sighs> so, so thanks, Matt, for that depressing um, presentation. Um, let's move on to the bridge-burning portion of uh, the program. Marcus, you were recently at the Seattle Times, recently left under your own volition. Yes. No layoff. No. Uh, Emancipation, you might say. <laughs> no. no. Emancipated from the Seattle Times. <laughs> Uh, how bad is it? Well, I don't know. I, Matt described everything as sort of the Titanic. It's not that bad. It's more so maybe the Hindenburg. <laughs> um, also no. did not end well. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I'll say this. I mean, I went into the, the Times sort of skeptical about whether, you know, large media institutions could really cover or had a commitment to marginalized communities, specifically in Seattle, which, you know, I've covered most of my uh, journalistic, journalistic career. And I left certain that, for the most part, I don't think that they are committed, you know, at least not in any substantial or significant way. And I think, um, you know, as Matt was showing, that, yeah, you're going to have, with uh, financial realities, you're going to have layoffs and so forth, but you're also going to have, I think, a diminishment in coverage of areas that, you know, don't necessarily subscribe to these large organizations. Um, you look at the Seattle Times, I think it's, it's top 15 zip codes. None of them are in South King County or South Seattle. Um, and I remember having a uh, uh, company-wide meeting with the CFO, and one of the questions I was asked of him was, um, well, what is your plan, essentially, for outreach to these areas? And it was kind of like a, well, basically, we don't have one. Um, and so for me, I mean, I think it's as bad as its coverage is, is getting in terms of uh, neglect and absence in areas. It's going to get that much worse 
in you know, these poor to median, median income areas? Um, is it because, is, is it simply a financial issue or is it also uh, just the structure of the company and the management that they can't see the importance of, or, or do they just not have the money to do what newspapers are supposed to do? I mean, I have to save some of this for my tell-all book, but uh, <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, I think it's a combination of things, right? I mean, it's a combination of, of that you're going to always prioritize um, areas and, and zip codes that you've always prioritized. Right. So if the paper of record, and that's what the Seattle Times is for Washington State, if the, the paper of record isn't really covering issues in South King County, then those things don't happen in, in the experience of the rest right. of the state. It becomes that the tree you know, falls in the forest and there's nobody right. there, right? Um, which is unfortunate, right? Which is why you need more hyper-local organizations, like not to shamelessly promote and plug, but yes, like, like the Emerald, like Erica. So. You know, I know a lot of people who've gone to the Seattle Times recently, ex-stranger uh, reporters, um, What's the general mood there in the newsroom? Um, <laughs> <that's>, uh, <laughs> <huh>. <laughs> How to be diplomatic about that. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I think it's, it's, you know, people know what the writing is on the wall at, at times. And um, I think, you know, for s some people, it's uh, very low morale. For other people, uh, depending on where they're physicians, uh, they're happy where they're at. So, um. so I think Matt's metaphor was more correct. It is the Titanic because they knew it was sinking, whereas the Hindenburg just went <laughs> all at once. Fair enough. Okay. Uh, Erica, I've known you for a long time. Uh, when we first met, I was the dumb blogger. Uh, you were the reporter for The Stranger. And uh, at some point, I became the reporter for The Stranger, and you became the dumb blogger. <laughs> Uh, in the intervening time, you helped start up Publicola, uh, but right now, uh, you, you told me I was wrong to say it, I described you as the last City Hall reporter, but you're doing it, whether you are the last or one of the few who's covering it full time, you are doing it independently, raising money from your audience. How's that working and is it sustainable? I mean, that's a complicated question because um, I think it is, uh, it has been sustainable for me as a person. So I have seen steady growth since I started Publicola, and, uh, for Publicola since I started the CS for Crank in um, 2015, almost as kind of a hobby website. I was working a part-time job at a nonprofit, and I wanted to get back into doing city hall reporting. Mm -hmm. um, and so I make more money now than I ever did working for publication, um, which is great, again, right now for me. Um, but the reason I say it's a complicated question is because, you know, I don't know that that model, I think that model is very, my model is very me specific right. in the sense that it's not easily replicable to, you know, somebody who's 22 years old and wanting to start out in journalism and there are no jobs for them. And so um, I think the thing that is sustainable about it and that may end up being part of the way that we save local journalism to some extent is that it's crowdfunded. And that is really going back to, I mean, people, you know, will sometimes say to me, um, you know, oh, well, they will say, oh, you're just a blogger, um, right. which is hilarious to me in 2019 that people would denigrate online media to the, you know, in, because it's not on a piece of paper. But, um, but um, it's, it's actually a very old model. I mean, it's no different than KUOW or... Um, any number of subscriber supported services that are free, you can go to my website and read everything. I don't have a paywall, I don't have any ads, but if you want to support me, you know, you give me five bucks a month and you, as a gesture of support. Um, and so I think that's an old model and I think that um, crowdfunding will probably end up being more successful than advertising because as we're seeing and as Matt was showing, I mean, it is just a death spiral. I mean, people don't want to advertise when there's no clicks. We sold ads at Publicola. It was, I mean, the, the worst thing about running your own website is selling ads for, for a journalist. So um, Yeah, been there, done that. Yeah, and I don't think that model is going to work for, for, for most people. And I think, you know, getting into these spirals, like, you know, you see uh, 
I mean, I don't want to call anybody out locally, but you see publications, um, I'll say like Sports Illustrated, just fired a bunch of people uh, or laid a bunch of people off. And they're going into this, um, this, this spiral where they're like, well, we're going to pivot to video and we're going to invest in all this video equipment and studios and we're going to fire all of our reporters and we're going to hire all these digital people. Everybody keeps trying that. And it, we've seen it on a local scale too where everybody's like, you know, getting into video because the kids want to watch YouTube or whatever. And it's just, you know, it's pitiful to watch because you're just constantly chasing, you know, the next thing. Right. You know, Matt, I was looking at one of your last uh, graphs there. It was showing the, that gradual rise in digital advertising, online advertising. Um, and it's a little encouraging, right, that in another 300 years it will, <laughs> at that pace, it'll catch up with where print was. Um, is advertising a, a viable business model in news these days? It's hard to make it work right now. Part of the problem is just scale. Um, you know, the individual outlets online don't necessarily bring enough subscribers to make that viable for companies to advertise on them. Uh, and Facebook and Google are just so good at monetizing advertising and making it just very, very easy to reach a segmented audience. Uh, and that, that's just not, that's not something you can do with advertising at a media outlet. You, you can reach, uh, you know, people who subscribe to uh, the Seattle Times, but you can't segment that down significantly more to the, to the same scale that you can uh, with Google or Facebook. Right. Uh, I mean, I, I think there, there are some interesting ideas being batted around about, um, some sort of, you know, Congress passing some sort of legislation that would allow media outlets to band together and function basically as a cartel uh, for advertising. Well, we had joint operating agreements. I mean, the Seattle Times and the PI operated that way for years. Yeah. Uh, I, I think at, at a larger and larger scale, though, it becomes difficult to do under existing antitrust law. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that, that would apparently need, need some form of... of um, Legislation, and of course, getting legislation to uh, help uh, media outlets in the current political environment uh, is a little bit difficult, as you saw from, from the chart about trust in media among Republicans. That's, it's hard to imagine that well, making it through. Yeah, Congress. it is fake news, so why would you want to help them out? Um, the, um, you know, I was, I think I told you this story earlier today at Horse's Ass in 2008. Um, I was making about $1,000 a month off of Google Ads, uh, which was, you know, not enough to live off of, but pretty good. It was, you know, steadily coming in. Uh, by 2010, and yes, we had the Great Recession, and so advertising sales plummeted. By 2010, my readership was slightly up, and I was down to about $120 a month from Google Ads. And my ads were always filled. There were never blank spots there. Uh, I've never been sure how much of that is advertisers were paying less or Google was taking more. I presume it was a lot of the latter. And that gets to what you're talking about in trying to compete with that Google-Facebook duopoly. Um, is the answer then that we just need another monopoly that <laughs> all the newspapers can... That or antitrust action to break up the existing monopolies, but I mean, there's not currently a model in which the advertising dollars are going to roll in for most places. There, are, there are a couple of uh, newspapers that can compete in that environment. I mean, like basically the New York Times and the Washington Post, which have mm -hmm. you know more than a million digital subscribers apiece. Uh, but if you don't have access to that kind of audience, it, it's hard to get the advertising dollars that you would need. Or maybe rather than breaking up Facebook and Google, we could uh, classify them as common carriers and regulate them like utilities and set their fees for them and the share that they split with content creators. Also an option. Can I make a labor-based um, sure. suggestion? I mean, one way I think that journalists are talking um, about addressing some of the problems that, you know, that we face as independents is banding together and forming something like a freelancer's union or uh, forming like a 
quote unquote, you know, a cartel of different small outlets um, that can all pull together and share resources. But also, I mean, it, when you look at the idea of forming some kind of union, one of the biggest challenges um, financially for somebody who's an indie is, you know, we pay our own health insurance. I don't get vacation. I don't get sick leave. Mm -hmm. I pay um, employer and employee taxes. Oh, yeah. I have no guarantee that I'll get paid. And, you know, in fact, um, as we found out today with the implosion of um, one of our local magazines, um, there is a guarantee that I will not get paid um, on one right. particular contract. In, in so. case <laughs> folks haven't heard, the parent company of Seattle Magazine has filed for bankruptcy. And they, it, very good accounting, according to the article, they owe somewhere between $1 million and $10 million. <laughs> um, In fairness, I'm sure they know exactly how much they owe. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, right, to, uh, uh, I think they were saying most of that was to vendors, um, uh, what was the second one? And, and the third one was freelancers, and we all know who's going to be paid last there. Um, Mark, is your experience starting up the Emerald? Uh, were you just this cockeyed optimist? You just, uh, you saw, hey, uh, news media is failing. That's what I'm going to get into. Uh, well, I mean, I was sort of a raving alcoholic for a while, so that, okay. was, that was that. Well, you know, that qualifies you that, for journalism. Absolutely. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I mean, I think I was in a state of delusion in the sense that um, you know, I had, was coming from the investment world. I worked for a hedge fund for five years, and I wanted to do something that was purposeful. And uh, living in the south end of Seattle, you know, so often the, anything that they ever talked about was Rainier Beach basketball or um, urban blight or crime. And there was just, I wanted to give to my community what essentially white males get in, in uh, how they're treated in the press, and that's with narrative, the privilege of narrative complexity. Um, and so for me, I took all my savings and put it into the, the Emerald uh, for the first three years to try to get a, a runway. Um, when, you know, we, when it proved very difficult to find uh, financing, um, my parents allowed me to move back in uh, with them to their house. I was literally that guy who was 35 living in his mother's basement, you know, dateless. And uh, um, eventually, my parents ended up losing their house because of, um, you know, because we had put everything into the Emerald. And um, thankfully, now it is, um, you know, thriving. Well, it's surviving. Um, but, you know, even then, I mean, it just goes to show you, it sort of epitomizes how hard it is to fund and um, continue a, you know, nonprofit you know, media outlet in this day and age. Um, if it wasn't seriously for the thousands of, of people that we've been able to amass over the course of six years, you know, we wouldn't be there anywhere. And that's, you know, and that took, in that six years, it took depleting my savings, losing a house, and, you know, sleeping on, you know, folks' couch mm -hmm. to, uh, just to make it survive. So, um, it's uh, not a great job if you, uh, unless you're really, you know, um, passionate about it. And, and we're insane. Yes, the, yes we are. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, my story, uh, I literally came at this as a midlife crisis. I, I mean, I was recently divorced. Uh, I lost a job after the 2001 uh, crash and was doing freelance tech writing work, which, by the way, is brutally boring <laughs> and pointless. And I stumbled into something where I thought I could make a difference. and okay, I'm going to do that and see how it works out. And I had no idea it would take over my life. Uh, Erica, uh, why have you stuck with this so long? I mean, my God, you worked for the stranger. Now, man, this is terrible. I'm going to be a blogger. That sounds so much better. You know, I mean, the, re the reason that I've stuck with it for so long, and I did this before I even moved to Seattle, um, I, you know, I was working for the Texas Observer and the Austin Chronicle in the 90s, um, covering local politics. I think local politics matter. And I think, and I'm constantly trying to convince people to stop paying so much attention to, you know, what's going on in the, you know, presidential horse race, Democratic campaign, mm -hmm. um, and pay more attention to what they can actually influence, which is the stuff that's right in front of them. Absolutely. And I think that that is critically important. And what, what scares me about local news is 
you know, um, if you look at the Seattle Times, a lot of their coverage right now, and they're doing some good work, but a lot of their coverage is funded through these enterprise funds that are, you know, mostly backed by corporations and, you know, entities that have their own interests. But even leaving that aside, if you are in a small town, I mean, all of the, you know, the sort of local community papers are dying. If you're in a small town, um, you don't even have that. You don't even have wealthy donors coming in and saying, here's $500,000, go hire five reporters. And so the idea that local news is just going to completely die and like things will happen and no one will ever know about them is, you know, is terrifying to me. So for me, like it, it really is just incredibly important to do what I can. And also, you know, it interests me and I find it really fun to wake up every day and decide what I'm going to write about. Um, Matt, so me being a local blogger, local writer, all of us here, I focused a lot on the, st on the plight of local media. And my God, at least in the political realm, it has collapsed over the past 16 years. When I first started going down to Olympia in 2003, there were these two press buildings packed to the core. Um, the major newspapers during session would have three people down there. Even some of the central and eastern Washington papers, the little papers, would have two people there full-time during session. And now there's like one half-filled building and you know, some of these publications don't exist. At the national level, though, it feels to me that news has gotten worse, but there's a lot more of it. <laughs> so I think that there are a couple of different things happening there. Uh, at the national level, I mean, you know, I think sometimes we talk about the story as if it's somehow distinct from other trends that we see uh, in the economy, but it's really part of a part and parcel of the same story of. Uh, you know, a drastic uh, sort of structuring of the of uh, various industries with a, a small number of winners and a, and a large number of losers, and, and the winners are winning better than they ever have, uh, and everyone else is just in a more precarious state than they've ever been. So, you know, there there are a handful of national outlets that are, are doing quite well uh, under the, the current circumstances. Uh, the New York Times, the Washington Post. Uh, Wall Street Journal, uh, a handful of others, uh, and if you work there, you're in a pretty good position. Um, but everywhere else, things just become, you know, drastically more precarious. And I, I think that has ramifications sort of up and down through the system. Uh, you know, another part of it is, you know, as I mentioned in the presentation, the the growth and metastasization of uh, the right wing press has had a dramatic impact. Just moving conversations to the right again and again. Um, they've really they've built us up a substantial infrastructure uh, that it has a, a great deal of impact on, on the rest of the media writ large. Um, you, you mentioned in your presentation the word trust. Yeah. Um, I have to tell you, every time President Trump uses the term fake news, I feel a little queasy because I know what he's trying to do, which is undermine the credibility of news media. And yet, I've spent a lot of my career as a blogger and media critic trying to undermine the credibility of members of the news media, editorial boards, editorialists, etc. cetera. Um, how much has trust really been undermined? Do people trust the media these days? Um, I mean, I, I think it depends. I, I think you have pretty strong trust. There's a reaction against uh, the president's attacks on the press because he is so unpopular among Democrats and progressives that just sort of creates a move towards the press when he goes after them again and again. So I, I think that there, there is some trust there. I don't know how durable that is. I don't know if that survives the end of his administration in any real way. Uh, and I think that frankly, that's going to be a big problem for the press and one that they have spent remarkably little time contemplating. What it means that uh, their subscribers are overwhelmingly 
on one side of the political debate and what happens if they, if they produce a product that those people don't like. Uh, I think journalists spend a lot of time thinking about the critiques that come from the right. I think that they take personally the idea that they are somehow biased against conservatives. Right. What a, uh, it's what a, a great very effective ref working. Yeah. The conservatives have been very, very good at doing this. Uh, but the flip side of it is that those publications are overwhelmingly dependent on uh, Democrats buying their product. And down the line, I, I don't know how that plays out. Yeah. Um, so, so, Marcus, it's no secret that I hate the Seattle Times editorial board because they are awful. You're in good company. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, so how does that work in the newsroom? They claim there is this wall between editorial and news. Is there really a wall between editorial and news? I mean, everybody in news must know what the board, and by the board, I mean Frank Blethyn. Hmm. <laughs> um, I mean, I wish he was just honest and would sign his own name to these editorials, but you got to know what the boss wants. I mean, he's the guy writing the paychecks. I mean, I think, was there ever like a, a dictate from on high on no, don't write this? No. But was there sort of potentially self-censorship of, uh, I don't know if this is, you know, is going to pass muster? I mean, I, I think there was some of that, obviously. Um, you know, I mean, I remember just, it, it just made it harder at times to just even do your job. I remember being on the light rail and they had dealt the Seattle Times editorial board had doubled down on their endorsement of Joe Fain, who was a state uh, legislator right. who was accused of, of rape. And, you know, people just on the light rail casting stones and arrows at me verbally and talking bad about my mother and everything else. And it's, it's like, <laughs> I do not control <laughs> what this man, you know, uh, man or this editorial board does. Um, and so, I mean, that, that in, in many ways locally, I think that, that very much hurts uh, trust and, and challenge trust, I'll say, when you were trying to go out and talk to somebody and then being like, oh, no, the Seattle Times, that's that, that paper that, you know, endorses whomever are, are and, you know, has these horrible impacts on us within our communities. And it just got to a point where it just wasn't worth it anymore. Right. So, but, but you worked for a newspaper with how many Pulitzer Prizes and how many four, five generations of Blethyn's you know, proving regression to the mean, but... <laughs> right, but, but, it, but it, it, depended on, it depended on where you went. Like, when I was in... It was interesting because I remember being at a... Uh, doing a story over in Kent and um, people being like, do you still write? I, I know you used to write at the Emerald. Do you still write? And this was like a year into the Times. And I'm like, yeah, I write for the largest paper in, you know, the right. region. And they're like, I do not see your byline. And it, it was just such a eye-opener to me that it that really how little that paper has currency in in certain areas and how um and how it looks like you know when it comes to actual trust you know how much people you know tr trust journalists and organizations that are more proximate to their actual day-to-day -day. okay i'm going to go devil's advocate with you erica uh and ask you the question that always got posed to me when I was blogging, which was, why the hell should I trust you? You're just some dumb blogger. You can just get out there and say, oh, I'm a journalist, because I'm showing up at City Hall and covering stuff. Without a newspaper masthead, without that banner saying, hey, professional journalist, pointing at you. Well, I don't know if the stranger ever really did that, but... Well, actually, I want to I give that as an example. So I came up in the alternative weekly world, which, um, you know, for, for the youths, um, there used to be free papers in every city. Um, and, <laughs> like, uh, you know, and, and that was, like, a really, you know, promising path for somebody who didn't want to be at a paper where you had to pretend that you didn't have opinions. And we were told we weren't journalists, constantly. I mean, you know, 1999, working for the Austin Chronicle, covering City Hall, we were told we're not real journalists because we didn't work for the Austin American Statesman, the daily paper. I think anybody who is outside of what would be considered the mainstream, like the big TV stations and the big newspaper newspapers, will always be questioned and maligned by a certain pretty small, frankly, portion of their audience. Um, and all I can say is, look at my work. I break stories. Um, I broke a story over um, on Monday, two days ago, that 
Um, KUOW and I were chasing each other on. KUOW had the same story a day late. Later, I don't want to cast aspersions on them because they were doing good work. Right. Um, Somebody has to be first. And yep, but uh, but just you know, right now I'm running a series of interviews with all of the city council members that uh, you know I, I think that you can see that the work is evident in the work. And additionally, I mean, I have 20 years, more than 20 years of experience at this point, and I don't mean to sound defensive, but I am defensive when people say that because it's such a ridiculous assertion that you would never make you know, to the Seattle Times, which, frankly, they got a major fact wrong in a story that I covered recently, and I corrected them on it, and strangely, it has not been corrected on their website, and no one is saying that they're fake journalists. Right. You know, I, I used to joke, when I went to the stranger that, that uh, coming from horse's ass, that I was the only journalist in Seattle who could see a boosting credibility by going to the stranger. <laughs> hey, I quit Seattle Weekly to go to the stranger. I mean, I, you know, I um, b back at that time, you know, we were doing really good work and breaking stories and running circles around, you know, some of the other reporters in town. So I would not denigrate alt weeklies for being alt weeklies either. So are you objective? Of course not. But neither is the Seattle Times. Ah, but the difference is you admit it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's why you get into alternative journalism, because you don't want to pretend. Because people at the Seattle Times, people at the Seattle Times used to not, and, and I'm not picking just on the Seattle Times, this is true of CBS, this is true of mainstream new newspapers all across the country, you know, they wouldn't even vote. Does that mean that because they don't vote or have a yard sign in their yard that they don't have opinions about things? Of course not. That's, that's absurd. And so, I mean, I actually think, and, I, and I'll say with this and I'll shut up, um, the idea of separation, a wall of separation between editorial and news is silly. Right. When, you know, when I, on every alternative weekly, I mean, I don't really do endorsements now because I'm one person and it's just me saying, here's how I would vote. Uh, if you like me, then vote like me. But, um, but the editorial board were the reporters of the paper. And we were very clear about that. Like, mm -hmm. we are the experts on this. We meet with these people every day. We watch them every day. And here's how we think you should vote. I never... First of all, I, I, on principle, I don't believe in unsigned editorials or endorsements, even the way we did it at The Stranger. I, I never, whatever people want to say about me, I never missed an endorsement interview. That was the most serious part of the job. It was always there. You couldn't tell from the way we wrote it, but we always took those seriously. Um, I will say on objectivity uh, that I used to say, at horse's ass, there's a wall between uh, editorial and news, and it's called a comma. <laughs> um, I had in my notes, Matt, that I was going to ask you if print was dead. But I'm going to change that. Is objectivity dead? I mean, I think that the idea that uh, journalists don't have opinions and that those opinions are not often quite obvious in the copy that they write is fairly ridiculous. Um, you know, I, Journalism is, is a series of decisions that are made about who to include in a story and who not to include in a story and which, what set of facts to use and in what order and how much credibility to ascribe to particular people or particular factions. Um, and there are a lot of different ways to make those decisions, but most of them involve reporters like using their brains in some way. Uh, the idea that, that like, these uh, stories come down from high on tablets somehow and are made entirely without uh, the actual involvement of uh, people who have opinions is just kind of ridiculous. So let, let's try to get in the time remaining to get a little positive. Well, I'll start with the negative. I'm going to sum this up. Uh, Seattle has one daily newspaper. Uh, in which the editorial board is run by somebody who hates Seattle. And as I like to say, it's a shame that Seattle voters have grown so out of touch with the Seattle Times editorial board. Um, but it's a, it's a shrinking newsroom and an editorial board that is in cahoots uh, in, in this election cycle, clearly in cahoots with the chamber and their allies, with Case, People for Seattle, Moms for Seattle, um, and they're clearly working this cycle with Como, which is owned by Sinclair, and uh, Cairo Radio, their hosts, 
uh, My Northwest, they're KTTH, conservative talk radio hosts. Uh, it's a uh, sickening and depressing uh, news environment. How do we fix it? Um, I mean, where... Folks on the panel, what gives you optimism, if there is any, about the future of local news media here in Seattle? I'll start with you, Erica, since you're actually doing it. You're doing something that I was unable to do, which was make a living, not a great living, but make a living as an independent blogger. Yeah, what gives me optimism is my readers. Um, right now, I have, I mean, it's not a huge number. I have about 600 Patreon supporters. Um, at patreon.com slash Erica C. Barnett. That's right, that's a plug. And, you um, can donate. You know, maybe 50 more on PayPal, people sending me random Venmos. I mean, so, uh, the, and, and getting encouraging, you yeah. know, like literally letters at my P.O. box, you know, people saying this is so important what you're doing. And I don't care that it's just a few thousand people that read my site, because honestly, that's probably all that you're going to get for a local city hall site. All you're going to get. And, um, but, I, but what makes me optimistic is that there are people who are willing to fund this. And I mean, look at bigger you know, outlets. I mean, I don't know how KUOW is doing on its fund drive, but they, you know, they continue to put out good, uh, good content and good reporting. Look at Crosscut, which is a nonprofit model that is also supported by grants and donations. And you know there are other models like that nationally. There's the Texas Tribune, which is a similar model to Crosscut. Um, so I think there are examples that are not just doing the same old thing and hoping it for a diff different result. So it gives me a little bit of hope. I mean, I think we're still basically screwed, but um, <laughs> but there's some but there's some hopeful examples for um, for whatever the new landscape is going to look like after print dies and after most of the online stuff dies too. Uh, I'm going to give you the benevolent dictator question, Marcus. What would you do to fix this? God, I don't know. I just blow it all up, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think we're going to have to change how journalism is, is funded, to, to be quite honest with you. I mean, I think having something, and Erica thinks I'm crazy before this, but I, I think having something like a democracy voucher system, and it's, instead of it going to... Um, obviously candidates, it would go to whatever uh, website or news organization that you liked. I mean, maybe have it be nonprofit. And so if you hate uh, media, liberal media and you think it's way too lefty or whatever, then go ahead and, and you know, donate your uh, democracy voucher or news voucher or whatever we would call it to... It would be a right democracy yeah. voucher. Well, yeah. Yeah, you don't have democracy without, without a free press. Exactly. And but so, uh, but I mean, we can't keep asking journalists to struggle and you know make a living off of fifty thousand dollars a year in a city that is going growing increasingly um expensive and uh, pretend that they're going to be okay and they just need to tough it out for, for 20 years i mean we are dying <laughs> literally and a lot of times and we need something drastic and transformative to happen uh matt where where is it working where are you seeing models that might translate, that we might pick up and, and replicate in Seattle? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we, we've talked about a good number of them. Uh, nonprofit journalism uh, has, uh, you know, s some places where it's working well, like the Texas Tribune. I, I think the Patreon system allows independent journalists uh, working on their own to, to make a good living, uh, in some cases, uh, doing the work. Uh, you know, as long as there are... Uh, journalists trying to fi find out the facts and people willing to pay for what they do, uh, there will be journalism out there. I, I think the problems are largely around scale um, and how you create a system that uh, allows people to do sort of longer-term investigative projects that allows you to train the next generation of reporters uh, since those uh, entry-level positions at, at newspapers and, and digital outlets are becoming less and less available, especially if you don't have like family money to fall back on. Um, those, those are some of the big problems that we're going to run into. But, I mean, it, it's not all hopeless that there are uh, some models that are seeing some results. Just a question of how well that gets spun up into a, a sort of broader scale. 
And if we don't, if we don't find a solution, are you going to see Seattle Times uh, part of the uh, gatehouse empire soon? Yeah, so, so this I mean, is explain, explain right. That. I mean, something that I didn't have time to fit into the presentation is that you know there's another option besides newspapers failing, and that is that there's a set of uh, investment companies uh, that are you know hedge funds or private equity based uh, that at some point have decided to buy up tons of newspapers across the country. Uh, and uh, basically demand huge profits from them, largely by uh, you know, vastly reducing the size of the staff and consolidating papers, merging them together. Uh, and so, you know, this year has seen uh, Gannett, uh, which I believe was the largest newspaper chain, get, oh sorry, the second largest newspaper chain, get bought by Gatehouse Media, which is the largest newspaper chain and is owned by a private equity firm. Uh, and so I, I think those hundreds of papers across the country are going to be going through some real trouble uh, in the days uh, and months to come. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I think the Seattle Times is what it's 50%, uh, 51% uh, locally owned, 49% Hearst. So yeah, that at some point could fall into that sort of. <laughs> Spiral. Not Hearst, it's. Uh, is it Hearst? I thought it was Hearst. So it's not Gannett. Who else is it? McClatchy. McClatchy, that's right. Yeah, that's they're 40, right. which, by the way, my understanding is that after they, they were Knight Ritter, yep. McClatchy got that 49% when right Knight Ritter was eaten up. Um, they, uh, a couple years later, wrote off that investment to zero. So McClatchy values 49% of the Seattle Times at zero, which means if I do my math right, 51% times zero is still zero. Yeah, okay. Um, boy, we timed this perfectly because I wanted to leave time for Q&A. Uh, I don't know that we got as much on the solution side if I had wanted, so if people in the audience uh, would have um, uh, have ideas, suggestions. Let's try to keep these as questions, though. Uh, we have a couple people with mics. Paul? Just one. Just one mic? Just one. There were layers. Uh, Paul will pick people out from the audience. And again, don't try to filibuster and try to ask your question as a question. Hi. I'm a proud supporter of both the South Seattle Emerald and um, C is for Crank. So thank you both for what you're doing. Thank you. Um, I'm also really interested in seeing what happens with um, uh, journalistic slash advocacy enterprises, whether that's Grist, uh, The Urbanist, uh, Investigate Northwest. Um, and at the same time, I'm also seeing how the Seattle Times is becoming much more advocacy oriented too. For example, what they did last year um, with their whole grassroots lobbying around legislation in Olympia. Do you think that hurts an organization's credibility or helps in terms of with uh, the audience's engagement with, an or with a news organization when it becomes very vocal in its advocacy? Now, I have a strong opinion on this, but I mean, who, who wants to go and take this? Which one of you wants this most? Um, I think, I, I mean, for, as a news consumer, I would say it helps me to know where um, my newspaper or news outlet stands with an organization like Grist. Um, you mentioned, I mean, they are very much an environmental advocacy organization plus a news site. Um, some really good reporting that the Seattle Times did recently was on um, a series they did on uh, private mental hospitals. And I would say that that was advocacy journalism. Uh, they probably wouldn't want to call it that because of their you know, pretense to objectivity, but it absolutely was advocacy you know, for better mental health care and for better, um, for, um, better oversight of mental health care. I thought that was great. I mean, I saw that and I was like, wow, this is what a daily newspaper can do. And so I, I for me, you know, and I, and I think the way that I was seeing readers respond to that as well, I think that that actually helps their credibility. Yeah, so, I mean, I think as long as you are transparent and transparent with your readership, then, you know, go out and report and, you know, be a reliable source of information. I mean, especially at the Emerald, I, I believe racism exists. I believe toxic masculinity exists. I'm not going to apologize for those things. 
And um, so, yeah, I mean, I would just say as long as an organization isn't trying to cover up or hide, you know, who they actually are and their identity, then, uh, you know, I say I'm all for it. Uh, I'll just add that at, at Horses Ass, which was incredibly biased, um, I, was, I wore my bias on my sleeve and I trusted my readers to read me in that context. What I hate is, you know, it's why I hate the Seattle Times editorial board so much. They pretend to be this civic, you know, oversight group, whatever, and no, they're incredibly biased. They're editorialists. Just be open about it and be open also on the funding, on the, the way the Seattle Times was funding their education reporting with grants from the Gates Foundation, who has a very specific education agenda, that's just it's not transparent. It makes me feel a little icky. And their transportation coverage with uh, funding from Kemper Friedman, who has, uh, who? Who has funded <laughs> most, really? of the, I didn't know that. most of the anti-light uh, rail um, uh, campaigns right. for the last, you know, uh, however many years. That is so funny. I had no idea. Could we get a lock of both of your hair so we could clone you? <laughs> um, but my real question is the 900-pound gorilla in the room, which is Google and Facebook and the aggregators, is there ever going to be a way, I guess, Matthew, that they can be forced to pay for the content that they mostly get for free and put out there? I don't know if that would quite be the mechanism. I, I think trying to... Uh, trying to force them to pay for things that, that, that are like sort of being placed on your Facebook wall or that sort of thing gets into some tricky territory. Uh, but I, I do think that uh, we're moving towards a place uh, in which uh, the public is becoming increasingly less comfortable with the amount of power that Google and Facebook have. Uh, I think we see that in the uh, large-scale state attorney general uh, lawsuits that are underway, uh, as well as uh, a lot uh, more discourse about the possibility of breaking up big tech companies than I think we'd seen in, in recent years. I also think it's important not to build your um, your business model as uh, as a media company on Facebook. I remember, and I will name a specific local example, when The Stranger um, really went all in on Facebook for a while, and that was kind of, they were relying on that algorithm to feed people, you know, to feed readers to their advertising. Um, I remember when Facebook changed its algorithm, I mean, there were posts from all these stranger writers, and I think they, they did some posts on their website, you know, this is so unfair and it's so terrible because Facebook had us all change our model so that we could, um, so that, you know, that would be where we'd get all our readers from, then they changed their algorithm, and it's like, well, maybe don't rely on Facebook, I mean, in the first place. And I realize that we're all facing, like, really tough choices and revenue is short for everybody, but, I think the best, the best thing to do is not to get too far in bed with any particular company and rely on its, you know, goodwill to, uh, to keep you in business. There were a lot of media outlets that pivoted to video because they thought that that was working really well on Facebook. And then we found out this week that Facebook had apparently been lying to the tune of uh, b overstating the amount of traffic that videos were getting on the website by 150 to 900 percent. So uh, Facebook is, has to pay the grand total of $40 million because of this, which will all go to the advertisers, not to the media outlets that built their websites around Facebook uh, I video am content. Shocked. And $40 million shocked. is peanuts. I mean, that is not, not going to keep anyone... It's not going to keep You're Facebook telling me doing the same Facebook thing again. Facebook can't be trusted? I know, right? Oh, my gosh. What next? <laughs> oh, that's a we great need, uh, We need a, like a baseball uh -oh. concessions vendor. Yeah, thank you very much. So, uh, my, my question is for Erica. The, you, uh, being a one man orchestra or a woman orchestra, trying to run this uh, small outlet, how do you pick your stories so you can you know, generate interest and people are not, you don't have to post like cat videos to attract people there? And how, as a small um, uh, newspaper, you, you gain the trust of your sources because they probably might not trust an independent journalist who doesn't have the cover of a bigger organization to talk to you. 
Yeah, I think this is one of the reasons that I think that, um, that I say that this model is hard to replicate, because I don't know, and, and you were talking about um, the next generation. The reason people, I think, trust me is um, because I've been in town for a long time. I mean, this is literally part of it, is like, I've been a journalist in Seattle since 2001, so I've been building sources for all that time. Um, now, certainly, like, I will, I mean, my, my website has a stupid name. If anybody has a better idea, please let me know. <laughs> Don't because, tell me about stupid names Because I started websites. it as a lark <laughs> when I was working a part-time job. So, yes, it, like, when I don't know somebody and I'm like, I'm from um, a journalist, um, oh, my website, yeah, mm, well, let me explain it to you for five minutes, you know, <laughs> that, that's hard. Yeah, you, it's got horses ass beat. <laughs> Uh, I, can, I don't know about that. I can There's tell no you swears in my title. that people, sources started trusting me at Horses Ass simply because they had no other choice. <laughs> there was so little media that was interested in putting out progressive messages. Uh, they, you, you, I can tell you a story where uh, there was this 65-page uh, public records request about uh, sexual harassment from the uh, commissioner of public lands, and it went to every newspaper in the state, and nobody would publish it because they didn't think it was important. And it came to me, and I couldn't believe it. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a front-page story. And I blogged on it, and the next day it was front-page above the fold. Um, and it only came to me as a last resort. Well, I would say, uh, you know, to answer the other part of your question about how I pick stories, um, right now, most of what I'm covering, I, I will always cover City Hall issues, but it is somewhat arbitrary <laughs> to what I am most interested in. Um, I, um, right now, I cover homelessness a lot because um, one of my sort of secret unstated missions is to cover the city um, in, with compassion and empathy. And um, that, like, I know that, that sounds cheesy, but, like, but I feel like there's, there's a lack of that um, in a lot of the coverage that we see, particularly of homelessness and of addiction. And addiction is personal to me, and so um, it's something that I am really trying to cover. And, you know, and it's also, I mean, if I was covering stuff that people were just like, you know, this is so boring. Um, there's definitely stuff that I've, I've covered less because people just have absolutely no interest in it. Like some of the um, inner workings of City Hall, palace intrigue stuff, um, I try to kind of dial that back even though I find it really interesting. Uh, Ken, I'm going to ask you a question on behalf of Paul. Do you miss having an editor? Yes. Uh, and, I, and I, well, and I have, I, I will say, I do, have, I do have a secret editor or two. But okay. But I do miss having an editor. I miss, I miss having a newsroom in a lot of ways. I mean, that's one of the things you lose when you're a work-from-home freelancer. And a lot of the work I do is freelance anyway, so I'm working with various editors, mm -hmm. but for my site, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of times I'll run something by, you know, a professional editor friend who is willing to work pro bono. Okay, so. there you go, Paul. <laughs> who do you have? More questions? Uh, I know that. I probably no one would have much sympathy for Sinclair in this room, but um, this, this question is for, for Erica. Um, it is my understanding that a lot of people learned about um, the Seattle homeless crisis by watching their terrible news program, um, and then were interested to find out more about it later um, from perhaps better websites and better news sources. I'm just curious, do you, uh, is there some value in even some terrible news sources that at least uh, generate some energy towards these issues? No, because it's negative energy. Um, I mean, is there value in other news sources covering things from a somewhat biased point of view? Sure. But, um, but that particular, the Seattle is dying um, propaganda piece, um, I think, was an almost unalloyed um, negative for the city because it presented false information um, as if it was fact. Um, for example, it said that there was this prison program in Rhode Island and they represented that as the solution to addiction for all homeless people who are addicted to all substances when it was a very small program in a prison for opiate addicts in Rhode Island. Um, 
So that's just one example. I mean, there are so many inaccuracies, and it stirred up. I mean, my dad, who lives in Texas, does not follow local politics. You know, called me up, and he's like, "Yeah, I saw this. Uh, somebody sent me a copy of this this show about Seattle. Are you safe out there?" And you know, I mean, it had just such a horrible impact and fed into the right wing, you know, sort of media cycle um, that uh, that Matt was talking about. Um, that is still going on today. And I don't know how we're ever gonna get out from under that because that, that negative story is so much more powerful than a positive story of, you know, people can get through addiction and they can become housed and they can get better and it's slow and over time because that's not a sexy story. What's sexy is, you know, Seattle is like covered with human feces on every surface and, you know, full of rampaging meth addicts who will like, you know, steal your clothes off you. I mean, that's, that's the message that story gave. Sorry to go on a rant, but I, I, but I think about that a lot, and I think it was a really damaging thing for our city. I mean, it's certainly that, that frame is the takeaway that people are going to get anywhere outside of Seattle. I mean, whether people right. locally then look for other, uh, you know, information about homelessness in the city, um, you know, if you're watching Tucker Carlson's show, uh, that, that is not gonna be your takeaway. Your takeaway is gonna be what you were told on the show. Right, so, so great job, Chamber of Commerce, in echoing this, you know, way to boost uh, business in Seattle. Um, you've got another? So how do we hold local media accountable when, they, when we know that they are, you know, omitting facts or when they tell a story that isn't like a full truth? Well, I'll, uh, you know what? Criticize them. If there are comment threads, leave comments. If uh, it's on Twitter, you know, you know, criticize them on Twitter or on Facebook. Send them emails, send them letters. I can tell you one thing, and a lot of people don't want to hear this, um, because we don't, we don't want the Seattle Times to go out of business. We want it to be better. But you know what? They hear you when you cancel your subscription. They ask you why. And, they, and, and that makes a difference. And sometimes it can help newsrooms to actually call them up and cancel your subscription. Cancel your subscription. If you feel bad about it, quietly resubscribe. But at least... <laughs> <laughs> but at least it lets them know. Uh, and, and I gotta tell you, journalists, they're, tr they're, they're trying, I, I won't defend the editorial board, but the journalists mostly are doing a great job and trying to do a great job and they care and they're overworked and they're underpaid and they really want to be liked and they want to do the right thing. And they respond to criticism. Nobody likes to be criticized. Um. Hi. So in like a post-fact world where so much of media at all levels is heavily funded by sponsors, what is objectivity and how do we work towards that? I mean, quantum mechanics will tell you that there's no such thing as objectivity because it, it really does not exist. And I, and I think we have this romanticism about objectivity. If you look at the history of objectivity with newspapers, it really traces back to William Randolph Hearst, who he saw objectivity, quote unquote, as the best way to sell newspapers because you can sell it to, when you don't, it doesn't have opinion to it or bias to it, um, you can sell it to a wider audience. And he was about making money and, and that's what he was able to do. I mean, it's, it goes back to what Upton Sinclair said hundreds of years ago, that if you um, marry capitalism and the market to journalism, then it, journalism will eventually disintegrate. Um, so for me, I don't, I don't know if we can ever have quote unquote objectivity, but we can't have fairness, we can't have truth, we can't have accuracy. And those are the things that we can strive for. I think we have time for a couple more questions. The uh, San Diego Union Tribune has way more content than the Seattle Times. It also has a whole lot of print advertising. There's, I think, as 
many or more tech savvy people down there that you know that are getting their news other ways or whatever but why why is is it a function of scale or but why is uh, print advertising working there and it doesn't work in Seattle hmm have any ideas on this? I, I don't actually know, and I, I would have to. It's not a larger see. market. Is not it? significantly. No, I. Let's see. So, I believe there are they owned by the same billionaire as the L.A. Times now. I think I think Patrick Soon Shang bought both of them, so that might be related in some way. So they have but resources. Possibly. I mean. Well, I think you can always find sort of one-off examples yeah. of, uh, of newspapers in particular that are like thriving with the old model. Um, I don't know the particulars of the San Diego paper, but I don't think that it's that they've stumbled on some secret that's necessarily applicable everywhere else. I mean, if they have, that would be amazing. But, um, but you know, having worked in, um, in print from a time when, you know, our newspapers, our weekly papers were 200-something pages a lot of the time to now, you know, the stranger's a bi-weekly and it's 36 pages or whatever. Um, you know, Seattle Times was 14 in the A section this morning? Right, the Seattle Times just got rid of its B section and shrunk down, I mean, as you, as you mentioned. So, I, you know, I think that something like that is an anomaly. Um, I think we, we can't really um, hope for print to come back at this point. And in some ways, I feel like some of the papers that are still in print and are obviously heading in that direction should really just go online only at this point and cut their losses. Well, I, I have a suggestion, a solution. Maybe all these businesses putting money into political mailers uh, might want to buy ads in the Seattle Times instead. Uh, I suspect they're doing mailers instead of putting their political ads in the time cause, Times because they don't think the Times is an effective place to advertise. Well, I don't because, know. But you can also, you can narrowly target with your, uh, your mailing advertisements in a way that you can't. Although you, some uh, might say that newspaper. targeting a print newspaper is pretty well, narrow casting too, at this yeah. point, <laughs> given who yeah. still subscribes to print. It's going to be, yeah. Excuse my voice, if it doesn't come out clear. I've been pondering that second headline, after local media disappears, what comes next? And ostensibly, that would mean more of us rely on national coverage. And we know about the biases, the Foxes and the MSNBCs. But I've had vigorous debates with friends and political foes about what would be the most centrist publications where we could find common ground. So I, I, I check out BBC, Al Jazeera. I haven't looked at Christian Science Monitor, Monitor in a long time. But does the panel have any thoughts about, uh, strong opinions about what some centrist publications on the national level that would provide better ground for kind debate and less fervor and attack than the extremist uh, sources? I mean, I, you know, I am probably one of the last people in America to use RSS feeds to uh, read my news. Um, but I, I, that means I subscribe to a lot of, uh, a lot of different publications. And, you know, I mean, I think we've, as Matt mentioned, I mean, we've got such a polarization that you're really kind of looking for, you know, maybe slightly to the left or slightly to the right. Um, you know, I love Talking Points Memo. Um, I would say that's a left-leaning publication, but I think that they do an absolutely an amazing job out of DC. Um, and that is the only one that is coming to mind right now. I mean, there, there are, there are um, you know, I mean, I guess you could call The Atlantic a sometimes right of center, sometimes left of center publication. Um, I don't know, anybody else have thoughts? No, I mean, I think just like you, you, as a consumer of news, I think you just have to be very uh, cognizant of your, your diet. And I think the days are gone where there's any, you know, one centrist, quote unquote, publication that people can look to. I think, you know, you're going to need to, hey, maybe it's 15 minutes of MSNBC and it's 10 minutes of CNN and it's, you know, an article, uh, you know, from the nation and then it's an article from the National Review. Um, that's kind of how you got to go about it at this point. Everybody needs to be a critic. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. You, you need to actively, it doesn't matter where you're getting your news, you need to approach it all like, how are they, you know, be a little suspicious always. Um, be, everybody needs to be a media critic these days. Uh, 
we're running out of time. I want to actually ask a question of the audience. Uh, so a raise of hands here. Um, obviously, we need something new. If somebody were to try to build an independent, crowdfunded newsroom, let's say a four-person newsroom, like the size of what the stranger was when I was there, how many people here would be willing to put up money? To subscribe or Kickstarter in some way. That's encouraging. Um, I've had a great time. I really want to thank the panel. Uh, this has been... This, is, this has been a great conversation. I wish we could have taken all your questions. Um, everybody, the, the, those three here, they, they all could use your support uh, with Media Matters, uh, the South Seattle Emerald, and C is for Crank. And uh, we don't need your support at Civic Ventures because we're funded by a rich guy. Uh, but we do have a podcast, Pitchfork Economics, you can find it at pitchforkeconomics.com. And I just want to proudly say that today we had our one millionth download. So after, after 10 months, we've had one million downloads, and that's a, a nice little uh, accomplishment. So I really encourage you to subscribe to the podcast. That's the best way to support us. And thank you for coming. Thank you.